And I'm thankful that you're here today. I'm also thankful that today we're starting a brand new series of messages all on the family. We're calling this series Family Circus. How many of you have ever felt like your family was a circus? Can I see your hands? Anybody like that? Okay. Those that aren't raising your hands, you're probably lying a little bit. Okay. And uh, we'll talk about that this morning. No, I'm just joking. And uh, I'm thankful that we can look to God's word and find instruction on the home and on the family as the culture is constantly trying to dismantle the family and disregard God's plan for the family, I'm thankful that we can look to God's word and know what God's design is. And by the way, if he's the designer, then he gets to determine what the design is. And it's our job not to dictate the design. It's our job to submit to that design. And so I'm thankful that we can do that this morning. And uh, you can go ahead and find a seat today. And if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to grab it. We're going to be in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 4 today. And if you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible in the seat back in front of you. And we'll also have most of the verses on the screen as well. But Genesis chapter 4 is where we're going to be today. We're going to start reading in verse number 1. Once you found it, would you say found it? Genesis chapter 4, verse number 1. The Bible says this, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. And bear Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the, first, the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell and the lord said unto cain why art thou wroth and why is thy countenance fallen if thou doest well shalt thou not be accepted and if thou doest not well sin lies at the door and unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him and cain talked with abel his brother and it came to pass that when they were in the field that cain rose up against abel his brother and slew him And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. For a few minutes today, I'd like to speak to this subject, trouble in paradise. Trouble in paradise. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll dive in. Father, we're so thankful for this day that you've given us. And God, thank you for your blessings and your goodness and your grace in our lives. Lord, thank you for what you did in the early service, and God, we're praying that you would be with the services to come today. And God, right now, specifically, as we look to your word and as we look to scripture, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit to give me the exact words that you would want us to hear today and to glean and to apply today. And Lord, I pray that we would be doers of your word and not just hearers only. We love you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, about nine years ago, our family went on vacation to Hawaii. And at that time, it was just uh, myself and Katie and our oldest daughter, Liv, who was about two at the time. And we were having a blast in Hawaii. We were just enjoying paradise, going to the pool, and Liv was enjoying the little slide that they had at the hotel. We were just having a great time. And one night, we went up to the room, and we noticed that Liv figured out how to open the door to the balcony, and she went out onto the balcony. And we were staying on the fifth or sixth floor, and so that made us nervous. And so Katie ran out there and she said, Liv, no, you're not allowed out here. And she kind of pulled her back in a little bit and and was telling her no. Now, Liv, my daughter, being Little Miss Independent that she was, she did not like that very much, uh, being told that she couldn't go out there and that uh, she had to come back inside. And so she threw what we like to call a temper tantrum. How many of you are very familiar with the temper tantrum, right? And uh, Liv was not happy. She started to cry and kind of throw a fit a little bit. And so uh, she uh, put herself down on the ground and she started crying. And Katie went to pick her up. But since Liv was resisting and since she was kind of fighting back, as Katie went to pick her up, uh, her shoulder popped out of socket. 
And so then she really started to have a fit, and she started to cry and scream, and now here I am in Hawaii Googling where the emergency room is and, and uh, where the hospital is so that we can go. And, and uh, we finally found the hospital. We made our way to the hospital, and we waited in the waiting room for hours uh, to see the doctor. And we were just in there waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, we went in, we saw the doctor, and he kind of felt her shoulder a little bit, and eventually he kind of just popped it right back into place without warning, which was uncomfortable. Uh, but after that, Liv felt so much better, and everyone was happy except me because I got a $1,400 bill from the hospital uh, saying that's how much we had to pay. And so the rest of the vacation, that's what I was thinking about. How are we going to pay for this, right? And we were having such a great time there in Hawaii, enjoying paradise, but then we encountered trouble in paradise. Now, this morning, as we come to Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3, what we find is God's perfect environment for human flourishing. What we find is God's design for a healthy family and a healthy soul. What we find is paradise. Uh, We see this very good, the Bible describes it this way, very good condition in the garden. In fact, Genesis chapter 1 in verse number 31 puts it this way. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. Everybody nudge your neighbor and say very good. It was very good. But there was one thing that was not good. Genesis 2 verse 18. And the Lord said, It is not good. Now kind of hit your neighbor. The other one say, not good. good. That man should be alone. And so this was God's perfect environment. This was paradise. This was God's design for human flourishing. But there was one thing that was not good, the Bible says. Adam needed companionship. Adam needed relationship. By the way, uh, we all need to recognize today that God has created us for relationship, that God has designed us for the context of community, that we are meant to live life not in isolation, but rather in collaboration, that he has called us to live in this kind of community. And so God gave Adam Eve. And uh, we know uh, what happens, that uh, that is Genesis chapter uh, one and two, and then we come to Genesis chapter three and everything changes. If you remember Genesis chapter 3, the serpent came to Eve and tempted Eve, and then Eve questioned God. Uh, Remember the scripture that says, yea, hath God said? Uh, By the way, you always get into trouble whenever you start to question the words of the Lord. Yea, hath God, did God really say that? Did God really mean that? And so Eve started to question God, and because God has given us a free will, that God did not just design us as uh, robots to just do um, uh, not what we want, but he gave us a free will, Eve decided to sin and eat of that forbidden fruit, causing Adam to sin and eat of that forbidden fruit, which triggered the fall of man and the curse of creation, and we have been dealing with the consequences of that decision ever since. So everything changes in Genesis chapter 3. You can remember it this way. In Genesis chapter 1, we have the beginning of creation. In Genesis chapter 2, we have the beginning of the family. In Genesis chapter 3, we have the beginning of sin. And in Genesis chapter 4, we have the beginning of all the consequences of that sin. And so everything changes in chapter 3, and we come to chapter 4, and we find there is certainly trouble in paradise. And I think Genesis chapter 4 is a very interesting chapter because we have a lot of firsts in Genesis chapter 4. We have the first uh, marriage, we have the first family, we have the first siblings, we have the first murder, uh, we have the first pregnancy, we have the first birth. A lot of firsts in Genesis chapter 4, and quickly we'll see that it was a family circus, that there was all kinds of turmoil and trouble that was taking place even in the first family. How many of you are familiar with the comic strip Family Circus? Anybody seen that comic strip? Uh, One of the longest standing comic strips that there is, the Family Circus. I think it's interesting. Originally, the Family Circus was not called the Family Circus. It was originally called the Family Circle. But there was a magazine that had that same title, and there was a pending lawsuit, and so they decided to change that name from the Family Circle to the Family Circus, which how many of you would say is all the more relevant, right? Uh, That we can resonate with that on an entirely different level, uh, because the family often is dealing with drama and conflict and chaos, and often it feels like a circus. Genesis chapter 4 is also interesting, not only because it has a lot of firsts in this chapter, but also we're told what is happening But we're not always told in Genesis 4 why it's happening. So we see what is taking place, but we're not given a lot of detail behind it. And I think that's interesting because that's often how life is, that we can see what is happening, but we're often not sure why it's happening. That maybe you are trying to navigate the complexity of a broken home. That that maybe you're trying to navigate the complexity of divorce. That you're trying to navigate the complexity of a wayward child. Often we can see what's happening, but we're not sure why it's happening, and we're left to walk by faith and not by sight. 
And so we come to Genesis chapter four, we see this family circus that's taking place, but in so doing, I believe that we find comfort and clarity in those times of chaos. By the way, aren't you so thankful that when we're navigating the complexity of life, that we have the word of God that can provide hope and clarity and certainty and comfort in our time of need. And so today we can look to Genesis chapter four. And and what I want to do as we begin this series and begin this message today, what I want to do is I just want to give us four principles from this text. And so if you have a habit of taking notes or you want to jot some things down, let let me give us four principles that I believe can lead to a God-honoring home, a God-honoring home. Number one is this, if you're taking notes, we have to recognize that God designed the family for blessing that God designed the family for blessing. Now, as the culture tries to dismantle the family and to discredit the family, what we're also doing when we do that is we're stepping away from the blessing that accompanies God's design. And so as we dismantle the family and the culture today, we're also dismantling all the blessings that come with God's design. And I want you to see in this first family how God designed family for blessing. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a couple of minutes just to look at verse number one. Would that be okay today? Just verse number one. Let's look at it. Verse one. And Adam knew his wife, Eve. Adam knew his wife. Now, this does not mean that they were introduced here. Okay? This doesn't mean that God said, Eve, this is Adam, and Adam, this is Eve, and nice to meet you guys. And that's not what it means. This is speaking of, it's a polite term speaking of sexual intimacy. In fact, this is the first time that this act is recorded in all of Scripture. This is the first mention. And so Eve... Uh, knew Adam, Adam knew Eve. By the way, we live in a culture that often through music and entertainment and media often uses vulgar and violent expressions to identify this act. But as you look to scripture, you see that this act is highly exclusive and highly sacred on the pages of scripture. And so Adam knew Eve and that God designed this act to be something that is reserved for the context of marriage. Now that is uncommon and even uh, laughable to some parts of the world today and, and to some cultures today, but that's the way that God designed it for human flourishing. In fact, 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, chapter 7, verse 2 says this, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, uh, that word fornication just means any sexual, sexual activity outside of the context of marriage, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. And so this was not done for our restriction. This was actually done for our liberation, for our greater freedom, because this is the way that God designed it. And so uh, God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And that's what they did. And so Adam and Eve, they knew each other in this context. Notice now verse number one again. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. And so Eve gets pregnant. Now, again, this is the first pregnancy in all of Scripture. Uh, This was the first pregnancy in history. There was no reference point for Adam and Eve on how to do this. Uh, There was no book on what to expect when you're expecting. Uh, There were no Lamaze classes that they could take. This is just something that they were figuring out on their own. Eve's belly just started to grow, and Adam's like, man, she's gaining some weight over there, and I'm not sure uh, what's what's all happening here. And uh, Eve's starting to have some pregnancy cravings, and she's like, Adam, I need some in and out. And he's like, I don't know. And and, uh, they're trying to navigate this whole season. And so this is something that is unfamiliar to them, but, but Eve conceives she's pregnant. And then notice what the Bible says. Verse number one, and Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare Cain. And what we see is the first birth in all of scripture. And what we see is that it is such a beautiful blessing when new life enters the world. Now, this is important because we, we live in a society that often wants to prevent children from entering into the world. And so we have to recognize in those moments when we're trying to navigate Christ in the culture and what the word of God says versus what the culture says, we have to recognize that the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter one, verse number five, he, he's speaking uh, to Jeremiah saying, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And, I orde- and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctify thee, and I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. And so long before Jeremiah was ever even born, that God had a purpose and God had a plan for his life. And can I just encourage you as followers of Jesus, we have to be at the forefront of advocating for and celebrating life in our culture today. And so we see that life is a beautiful thing. It's a blessing. The Bible says in Psalm 127 that children are in heritage of the Lord. The fruit of his womb is his reward. That tells us that children are not a burden. They are a blessing, that they are a gift from the Lord. And so we have to celebrate this. And so uh, Adam and Eve, they knew one another, and they they came together. She conceived, and she bare Cain. Now, the last part of verse 1. 
And then she says this, and I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, that to me sounds like a funny thing to say. <laughs> she gives birth and she's like, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And uh, in fact, the name Cain is an interesting name. It has an interesting meaning. It literally means here he is or I've got him. So it's like, what a special name, right? Like, like wow, here he is. I've got him. That, that's, what, that's what we should name him. Here he is. I've got him. Let's name him Cain. Uh, that's, that's the name. Now, the question that I have for us today is why did she name Cain Cain? Why did she name him? Here he is. I've got him. Uh, the name Cain uh, is similar to the Hebrew word acquired. Like, here he is. I've got him. Well, the reason I believe is because in the chapter before, God gave a specific promise to them. I want you to see it in Genesis chapter 3. If you're still with me, would you say amen? Genesis 3, verse 15. And I will put, this is God speaking, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, this is a very significant verse in Scripture. Theologians often call this verse the Proto-Evangelium, and that's just a fancy way of saying the first gospel that this is the first gospel mention in all of scripture. Yes, in Genesis chapter three, Adam and Eve sinned and triggered the fall of man and the curse of creation. And yes, we've been dealing with the consequences of that sin ever since. But God in verse number 15 made a promise that from the seed of this woman, Eve, there would come one that would crush the head of the serpent once and for all. And we know that this was a promise and a prophecy that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, that he is the savior, that when he went to the cross and when he rose again from the dead, aren't you thankful that he crushed the head of the serpent and that he is victorious once and for all. The first gospel mentioned, Genesis 3.15. But in Genesis 4.2, in Genesis 4.1, when Eve has Cain, she thinks, here he is. I've got him. She thinks that she's holding the Messiah in her arms. Talk about having big expectations for your kids, right? <laughs> you thought your kid was going to make it to the NBA. <laughs> she thought her kid was the savior of the world. She undoubtedly would have shown a little bit of favoritism to Cain. Here he is. I've got him. Uh, when my daughter Blakely was first learning about the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, how Joseph had a coat of many colors and how he was betrayed of his brothers because he was the favorite, she came to Katie and she said, I'm learning about the boy with the rainbow coat. And I've learned that, Mom, you're not supposed to have favorites, but you can have the cutest. And I'm the cutest, right, Mom? <laughs> she wanted to make sure that she was the cutest in our household. I think that Eve undoubtedly had a little bit of favoritism towards Cain, and she thought that she held the savior of the world in her arms, but the tragic reality was she held the first murderer in her arms. And we have to be careful. I think it's good to have big dreams for our children, but the first and foremost prayer request is, Lord, we want your will to be done. God, it's not about my desires and living vicariously through my children. God, it's about your will being accomplished in my children. Not my will, but thine be done. And by the way, there needs to be some moms and dads and some grandparents that would pray earnestly for the next generation because the next generation is going to fight some battles that we didn't fight. And so we need to have a church family that has some prayer warriors that is praying for uh, the next generation and recognizing that children are not a burden, they are a blessing, that God designed the family for blessing. That's number one. Here's the second principle today. Number two is this. Where there is family, there is responsibility. Now, within the home, we recognize that there is responsibility. And I want you to see this responsibility played out in verse number two. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep. And so a shepherd is a very familiar occupation throughout the pages of scripture. And this is the first mention of a shepherd. It was Abel. And Cain was a tiller of the ground. And so Cain was a gardener. He was a farmer. And I want you to see that Adam and Eve, in some regard, they trained their children well. In two areas. I want you to see they trained their children in their faith. You say, how do you know that Adam and Eve trained Cain and Abel in their faith? Well, Cain and Abel, as we'll see in this text, they knew and believed that there was a God. They knew that their sin was offensive to God. And they also understood the priority and the importance of sacrificial worship. As we'll see, they brought an offering to the Lord. And so Adam and Eve did well in training their children in the faith. And I want you to know that it is the primary responsibility of the parent to train their children in the faith and to raise up the next generation in the way that they should go so that when they are old, they will not depart from it. Now, don't get confused. That responsibility is not the responsibility of the church. It's not the responsibility of the school system. 
It's certainly not the responsibility of the government. It is the responsibility of the parent to train up the children in the way that they should go. Now, the church wants to come alongside, and we want to assist, and I'm so thankful. How many of you are thankful for Rock Hill Kids and the nursery workers and all the teachers? And we want to come alongside and partner, but the primary responsibility is that of the parent. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 6 says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, uh, Moses speaking to parents, and he says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. In other words, Moses says that teaching and impartation of truth should be an everyday occurrence. Uh, that, that all throughout the day, you are training and teaching uh, the next generation in the ways of the Lord. Uh, the other night, our family was at a Quakes game, Rancho Cucamonga Quakes. Any Quakes fans in the room today? And uh, we were watching the game, and Liv and Luke, they were intently watching. They were enjoying it. And Blakely was sitting there bored out of her mind, and we were trying to kind of help her uh, enjoy the game. And uh, she was kind of just bored, and she looked out, and the sun started to set, and she kind of blurted out. She said, Dad, look, God is starting to paint his sunset. And it was a small comment but it did something big in my heart because as a father, I want to point my children to their creator. I want to point my children to the God that loves them more than we could ever possibly think or imagine. And so Adam and Eve, they did well in some regard in teaching Cain and Abel uh, the importance of faith. Not only did they train them in regards to their faith, but they trained them in regards to their responsibility. Because did you notice in verse number two that Abel was a shepherd and that Cain was a gardener? He was the farmer. That meant that they had some responsibility. That meant that they had to work. In 2016, there was a word that became very popular in our culture. It was the word adulting. How many remember this word? It was popular amongst millennials. And you would use that word adulting, talking about things like, I've got to pay my cell phone payment and I'm adulting now. And I've got to actually go to work like at eight o'clock in the morning. I'm like adulting now. And it was this, this whole phase, right? Like I'm adulting. It's this tra transitional phase. What we've done in our culture and what we've done uh, in uh, this generation is that we have taken responsibility and we've turned it into a negative thing. We've taken work and we've turned it into, uh, we've turned it into a curse. But, but here's something that is so significant in the book of Genesis. So significant in the book of Genesis is that responsibility was given to man before the fall of man. In other, in other words, before Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter 3, God gave them work in Genesis chapter 2. He gave them responsibility. So in God's perfect environment, in paradise, there was work. Adam, you've got to name the animals. That was the mental effort. And you've got to take care of the garden. That was the physical effort. They had responsibility. Now, that kind of goes against the grain of our thinking because I don't know about you, but if you're going to create your perfect environment, you're probably going to have something like a hammock and a good book and a smoothie and a sunset. And, you know, our perfect environment might not include an alarm clock, but in God's perfect environment, he included responsibility. And so I want to encourage uh, all of us today to recognize this, and especially uh, parents of young children, to not do too much for your children, to let them learn the blessing of responsibility, uh, to let them learn the importance of work. Now, we are not to worship our work, but we are to worship through our work. And so don't idolize your occupation. Don't idolize your work and never spend time with family uh, and never go on a date night and never spend time playing with the kids. No, we don't idolize work. We don't worship work, but we should worship through work because whatever we do, we are to do all to the glory of God. And so we have to learn the blessing of responsibility and to take uh, responsibility, the responsibility of parenting and the responsibility of child uh, rearing. And so this leads us to our third principle in the text, and that is this. A strong family is the result of sincere worship. If you want a strong family, you have to know that a strong family is the result of sincere worship. I read this article uh, this week. It was of a mom named Sue Struthers, and she was talking about how her son was getting ready to go into basic training, and he was going to join the military. And so she took the day off work to spend one last day with him before he was going to go, and, and uh, they were spending time together, and she said it was a real emotional day for me. And she said that we were in the car driving, and I heard my son say, I'm really going to miss you. And she said that kind of made her tear up a little bit. And she looked over at her son because she was going to say that she was going to miss him too. And then she noticed that her son was holding a can of Pepsi and he was talking to the can of Pepsi saying, I'm really going to miss you uh, when I'm going to basic training. And uh, sometimes our relationships aren't quite as strong as we think they are, right? And I want to encourage you that the Bible actually gives us design and instruction on how we can have a strong family. And one of the greatest ways that we can have a strong family 
is the result of having sincere worship in the household. I want you to see how it's played out in our text. If you're with me today, would you say amen? Amen. That was verse three. And in the process of time, in the process of time, that means there was a specific point in time that was important to this family. We don't know exactly what that time was. It could have been the harvest time, the harvest season, but there was a specific point in time. In the process of time, at the end of that time, they went to worship and offer an offering to the Lord. And what I want you to see is that they had a specific time that they went to worship the Lord. I believe that it's important for every family to have a specific time in which we go and worship the Lord. Now, we are worshiping at all times. Uh, We are unceasing worshipers because worship means to ascribe worth to. And so if you are giving all your time and energy into your work, then you have made your work the object of your worship. And so we worship all kinds of things. And so we have to recognize this and make sure that we're not... uh, Uh, unintentionally falling prey to idolatry, but there should be an intentional time that we set aside for corporate worship where we come together as a community of believers to worship the Lord. Now, Adam and Eve raised Cain and Abel to uh, prioritize this time because in the process of time, when that time came, they knew, okay, it's time to go give an offering to the Lord. Everybody tracking with me today? There was a certain time. And so in this process of time, they're gonna go and they're gonna offer this offering. Notice what it says in verse number uh, three. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground in offering unto the Lord. And so they, in this household, in this first family, they prioritized worship. Uh, this was a priority. Now, something I've learned in life is that we always make time for what's important to us. Uh, we always know how to prioritize certain things. I read this past January uh, at the Kansas City Chiefs games. There was a a record for one of the lowest um, uh, temperatures in an NFL game. It was negative four degrees with a wind chill of like negative 27. And these fans were there just loving every second of it, right? Uh, There was a, uh, the uh, research medical center after this said many of these fans that were at this game went to the hospital and had to have fingers and toes amputated because of frostbite. Uh, How many of you would say that's some serious commitment, right? Uh, We know how to make time for what's important to us. Now, I'm not saying that we can't enjoy life and we can't enjoy sports and, and hobbies and things like that. This. And in fact, if you want to know where I'm going to be every single Monday for the next uh, seven Mondays at 530, I'm going to be at my son's Little League baseball game. Okay, we're going to be there cheering him on. And uh, we want to say yes to sports and yes to hobbies and yes to fun. But ultimately, and most importantly, we want to say yes to the Lord. And whenever a secondary thing starts to crowd out the primary thing, then we have made that secondary thing an idol in our lives. And so we have to be very careful to prioritize uh, corporate worship and coming together. And a strong family is the result of serious and sincere worship. And so they're going to come and they're going to worship the Lord. But notice the manner in which they do it. Verse 4. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. In other words, that just means that he brought the best. The the fat was considered the prime portion. And so he brought his best uh, before the Lord. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And so Cain brings the fruit of the ground. Abel brings the blood of an animal. And the Lord had respect for Abel's offering, but he did not have respect for Cain's offering. And the question that has been talked about for centuries is why? Why did God not have respect for Cain's, but he did have respect for Abel's? And a lot of times we jump to what was in their hands. A lot of times we jump to the conclusion, well, it's because of the sacrifice in which they brought. And I'm not convinced that's the case because if you read in Leviticus chapter 2, God actually received a grain offering and it was acceptable unto him. And so it wasn't so much what was in their hands as it was what was in their hearts. And I think a lot of times in our human nature, we focus on what's in our hands while God is looking at what's in our hearts. And Abel comes, and he has a pure heart before the Lord, and Cain does not, as we'll see. In fact, the best commentary on Scripture is Scripture. And so if you want to learn more about the Scripture, read more Scripture. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 4, by faith, everybody say, by faith. That was the key. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And so why did God accept Abel's sacrifice? Because he brought it by faith. It wasn't so much the actual sacrifice as it was the heart behind the actual sacrifice, that he had a pure heart before the Lord and Cain did not have a pure heart before the Lord. And a lot of times, a lot of times in Christianity, we get so mixed up about this because think about this for a second. Everybody with me today? Cain's offering was more aesthetically pleasing. 
Think about it. Cain brought the fruit of the land and the grain. That would have been nice to look at. I'm sure he organized it in a nice way and he presented it to the Lord. It would have been aesthetically pleasing. But here's what you need to know. Dead religion is often aesthetically pleasing. That often we know how to look good on the outside. And often we know how to polish it up and make sure that what's in our hands looks presentable and that we know how to say the right things and look the right part. And if we're not careful, we will have the form of godliness, but we will deny the power thereof. And so Cain brings an aesthetically pleasing offering to the Lord. And think about this. Abel's offering was not aesthetically pleasing. He brought the blood of an animal. Uh, This was a seemingly dreadful thing. The blood of an animal. And that's the point. That our sin is a dreadful thing. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And I want you to know, Abel brought this one lamb and it offered, uh, he offered this sacrifice uh, for atonement for one man. It was one lamb for one man. Later on in the book of Exodus, as we see uh, the Passover lamb and they were instructed to put the blood of the, of the lamb on the doorpost, it was one lamb for one family. Later on on the day of atonement, it was one lamb for one nation. But aren't you thankful that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, it was one lamb for the sins of all of humanity. Behold the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And what we need to know is that all the Bible is pointing to one person and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the perfect, spotless, sacrificial lamb who died in our place for your sins so that we might have a home in heaven when we die, not based on our goodness, not based on our merit, but based on his blood that he shed for us and his goodness in our lives. And so uh, we have to recognize that uh, Abel here, uh, he offered this offering by faith. And so as we lead in our homes and as we cultivate a godly environment in our homes, we have to prioritize sincere worship, not just putting on a show. God is not looking for a show. He's looking for sincerity. And so we have to prioritize this in our homes. Now, this leads us to our fourth and final thought. You ready for number four today? A godly home puts emphasis on self-control. This is so important. No matter what your role is in the family, maybe your husband, maybe your father, maybe your child, maybe your mother, maybe your grandparent, uh, whatever uh, your role is, that we all have to prioritize and put this emphasis on self-control. Notice verse number five. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. Cain is angry. You say, how do you know Cain didn't have the right heart when he worshiped? Here's why. He gets very angry. He's very upset and his countenance fell. He's showing his true colors here. He's showing what was really on the inside. And so he gets very angry, verse six. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth and why is thy countenance fallen? Now, the Lord God is omniscient. He knew the answers to those questions before he asked them. But what was he doing? He was giving Cain an opportunity to confess and to make it right. See, everything could have changed for Cain right here. God is so gracious and so merciful. Do you believe that today? Notice how when Cain brought an unacceptable sacrifice to the Lord, the Lord didn't just write him off. He didn't just say, you know what, Cain, your heart wasn't right before me. Just get out of here. No, he goes to Cain. He asks him questions, and he's giving him an opportunity to get back on track. And maybe today you are at a crossroads and you are thinking about making an important decision or you're trying to figure out, should I follow the Lord or should I do my own thing or what should I do? And God in his graciousness and in his mercy, he gives us time to come to him and to repent and to get back on track. It's not too far gone. And so he comes to Cain and he says, Cain, why are you so angry and why is thy countenance fallen? Now now, notice what he says. Verse seven. He says, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Now, that's encouraging. He tells Cain, you're so worried because your offering wasn't accepted, but if you would do it the right way with the right heart, you'll be accepted. And so Cain was searching for acceptance, but he was searching in the wrong places. And so the Lord says, if you just do it with the right heart, you will be accepted. You don't have to worry about this. And if thou doest not well, watch what God says. Sin lieth at the door. What a warning. He says, if you don't do it my way and you just want to do it your way, be careful because sin is lying at the door. The, the, the illustration is easy to understand. It's like an animal that is just lurking, waiting to pounce, waiting to attack. Uh, sin lies at the door like, like the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. And God was telling Cain, if you don't get this anger under control, if you don't learn to subdue this temptation and resist this urge to lash out in your flesh, just know that sin is lying at the door, ready to attack. God is giving him warning, and, and, and he's heeding 
uh, he's telling Cain to heed this warning to get back on track. Be careful, Cain. Don't do what you're thinking about doing. Be careful. And then he says at the end of verse number seven, and thou shalt rule over him. God's saying if you do it the right way, if you do it with the right heart, you can rule over the enemy. That you can get victory over that temptation that's lying at the door. And this is good news today. If you are struggling with lust, if you are struggling with anger, if you are giving into that temptation over and over again, through the power of the Holy Spirit of God, you can rule over that temptation. And you can get victory. And you can say what Romans 6 says, that sin shall not have dominion over me. God was telling Cain, hey, you can get back on track and you can get victory. Be careful. Be wise. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, 25, verse number 28, this is something that's so important in the home. This is something that we've told our children often. Some of our children have this verse memorized. Proverbs 25, verse number 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. It's so important that we learn through the power of the spirit to practice self-control and to have rule over our own spirit and to con- not to listen and to feed into our emotions and to feed into our feelings, but to listen to the word of God to subdue our emotions and our feelings, to practice self-control. Notice how Cain responds though in verse number eight. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. This is murder in the first degree. This is premeditated that Cain was given warning, that God was saying, Cain, sin's lying at the door. Be careful, listen, don't go this route. And Cain was so angry in his flesh. He was so angry with his brother and so angry that God didn't accept this sacrifice that looked good to him that he went and he murdered his brother. Verse nine. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? Again, again, God's showing mercy. Again, God already knew the answer but he's giving Cain another chance to confess and to make it right. Where is your brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Now in that statement, we see two things. We see a lie and we see a revelation. A lie in the fact that he knew where his brother was, but he lied to God. I don't know. And then when he said, am I my brother's keeper? Uh, What we see is a revelation of his heart. We, we see a window into his heart. We know the character of his heart in that statement. Am I my brother's keeper? That he had the audacity to speak to God with that kind of flippancy. By the way, I'm so thankful that we can approach God freely, but that doesn't mean that we approach him flippantly. And so Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? Spurgeon, he said this in regards to that statement. The cool impudence of Cain is an indication of the state of heart which led up to his murdering his brother. And it was also a part of the result of his having committed that terrible crime. He would not have proceeded to the cruel deed of bloodshed if he had not first cast off the fear of God and been ready to defy his maker. In other words, the reason Cain was able to carry out this murder is because he first cast off the fear of God. He started to view God flippantly without that kind of honor. Now, the Bible uses Cain many times, even in the New Testament, as a warning to us. And so I want to close today with just an admonition. I want to close today with a warning that I believe all of us should heed. Because Jude chapter 11 mentions Cain, and it says this, Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. And so Jude is warning us, be very careful that in your life you don't go the way of Cain. You say, well, what's the way of Cain? The way of Cain is empty, dead religion. The way of Cain is superficial. But ultimately, the way of Cain is doing things how you want to do them and disregarding how God wants them to be done. Going the way of Cain is just doing it our way. I've got to figure it out. I can do this uh, the way that I want. I can trust my instincts. That's the way of Cain. But I'm here today to tell you that there is a better way. And his name is Jesus. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. And so today... We have a decision to make, and you have a decision to make. Am I going to choose the way of Cain, or am I going to choose the way of Christ? Am I going to do things how I want them to be done, how I think they should be done, what looks good to me from what I can see in my perspective, or will I submit to the way of Christ? And today, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, today can be the day of salvation for you, because just like Abel, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 4, uh, by faith, Abel brought this offering. That's how we approach God. That's how we can be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, not of works, 
uh, lest any man should boast. And so today, if you're unsure about your salvation, I would encourage you, place your faith in Jesus Christ. Call upon his name, and the Bible says you will be saved. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes today.